Hi, my name is Valerie and I'm a convicted felon. I want to tell you the story about how God unleashed his grace and mercy in my life. Everybody deals with pain in different ways and everybody experiences pain. Some people deal with it in healthy ways and some people deal with it in unhealthy ways. I dealt with my pain in very unhealthy ways for a long, long time. Um, my pain started um, as a young woman. I am a survivor of emotional and physical abuse as well as a violent sexual assault. Um, in those things, it, it caused a lot of shame and guilt, so I did a lot of suppression. I did a lot of um, pretending it didn't happen and wanting to avoid and run away from the reality. And the way I did that was by using drugs and alcohol to numb the pain and to just try and get on with life and survive. I spent about two decades running from the pain, um, and in that process, I developed an eating disorder. Um, I hid things really well and also developed a pretty severe opiate addiction that caused me to lose my nursing license, lose my career. I almost lost my marriage and my husband and my family, and I could have lost my freedom. God redeemed my life the minute I decided to surrender to him. And for me, that looked like going to a three-month inpatient rehab facility. There, I was able to get the healing I needed through Christ-centered therapy, confront PTSD, my disordered eating, my opiate addiction, and all the hurt from the past. And in that, I found freedom. Uh, I was able to forgive uh, what had been done to me and what I had done to others. And because of that process, I was also able to renew my relationship with my husband, my friends, my family, and I'm a completely different person because of it, and I'm so grateful. The part I'm most excited about with this, giving this testimony and telling my story is the healing part and the redemption part. So if you feel held captive to your circumstances, if you're running from pain, I want to invite you. Um, there is a way forward. All you need to do is surrender to God. Um, what I do is surround myself with accountability. And for me, that's going to celebrate recovery, that's um, attending therapy, that's being honest and transparent about how I feel about things and being okay with not being okay. If you are struggling right now and you're having a hard time with your circumstances and running from pain, I wanna encourage you there is a way forward. I'd like to invite you to celebrate recovery. We have it available at Calvary on Monday nights and at Hilltop on Thursday nights. Um, and in those places, you'll find people who have been through similar struggles that have overcome some pretty difficult circumstances and they have done it through leaning on Jesus. I'm now celebrating almost two years of sobriety and healing. And although the state of Arizona may call me a convicted felon, I know my true identity is in Christ and I am a child of God. I, I never get tired of hearing how God has redeemed, restored, healed, and set people free, which is why we uh, uh, have a series called Unleashed, because that's what God wants for you. God wants to change your life. He wants to set you free. He wants to unleash you from those uh, obstacles, those burdens, those habits that are holding you back. And uh, we want you to find freedom in Christ. Uh, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is our text today, and uh, we want uh, you to follow along with us. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 969, and you will find Matthew chapter 10, and you'll be able to follow along the text. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. So um, what are you afraid of? What, rational or irrational, doesn't matter. What is it that you are afraid of? What fear do you have in your life, in your heart? Uh, if you're bold enough, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take about the next 10, 15 seconds and share it with some of the people sitting around you. Listen to their fear. You share your fear. See if you guys are afraid of the same thing. Ready, set, go. 
Share your fear. Some of you are like, I'm afraid to talk to strangers, and you just asked me to do that. So I'm not going to do it because I'm afraid. Apparently, some of you are afraid of getting kissed in public because I saw some people doing that. Uh, so it's just emotional support. I'm sure that's what it is. So if you go online and you look, you can find the top 10 worldwide fears. Apparently, they surveyed people from a whole bunch of different countries, and they found out what the top 10 fears are around the world. So we're going to find out how afraid we are, how we relate to these. So number 10, the fear of holes. Yeah, you guys are like I am. I'm like, what? I never heard of that one. People are afraid of holes? Like they're afraid of falling in a hole in the ground. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen anyone afraid of Swiss cheese, but uh, <laughs> is there anybody here who's afraid of holes? I'm just curious. Nobody's going to raise their hand now. All right, well, let's go to number nine. How about fear of flying? Anybody afraid of flying? Okay, those hands go up. Uh, and you're like, I'd go with you to the Holy Land, but uh, I, there's not a, a road that gets there. Uh, okay, number eight is the fear of germs. Any germaphobes here? Yeah, that number's probably going up with the coronavirus, isn't it? Uh, people are like, I, I wasn't afraid of germs now. I, I am deathly afraid. Uh, number seven is the fear of small spaces. Claustrophobia, anybody? Oh, those hands went up. I found out that my wife has claustrophobia when we were camping, and the first time she tried to sleep in a tent, it did not work. So uh, let me just tell you, that was a fun night. Uh, so number six, thunder and lightning. Anybody, anybody got that one? Thunder and lightning. Okay. Not as, I don't know how it got to be number six because not as many people raised their hand on that one. Okay, this one's totally shocked me, totally surprised me, may surprise you. Number five is the fear of dogs. People, anybody got that? Okay, see, my, my granddaughter has that. She's, she's fascinated and terrified at the same time of, of dogs. So uh, hopefully she'll outgrow that. Number four is the fear of crowds. Anyone got that one? Yeah, actually, I see some people here. See, I thought those would be the people at home watching this from home. You know, they're the ones going, that's why I'm not there, because it's a crowd. Uh, so thank you for being here in the midst of the crowd. And you're not all sitting on the back far corners of the, of the room. Okay, number three, expect a lot of hands on this one, the fear of heights. How many of you are afraid of heights? Oh, lots of hands go up. Okay, that one's, that one's kind of accurate. Pretty sure the, the, the next two are pretty accurate as well. Number two is the fear of snakes. <laughs> oh, hands weren't good enough. We had to, like, make noise too. All right, number one is the fear of spiders. Okay. See, more hands went up for snakes than spiders, so I don't know what that means about us, but Jim Stafford had it right, didn't he? Uh, I don't like spiders or snakes. Uh, so anyway, we all have to deal with fear. It's part of our life. And, and here's the thing. If we give in to fear, if we let fear control our lives, then that fear is what controls us. That fear determines how we live, what we do, and, and who we are. So I want to just begin this discussion by talking about the prison of fear. The prison of fear, because that's what fear is. It, it literally is a prison that stops us from being the people that God has called us to be, created us to be, wants us to be. Remember, uh, Jesus came to set us free, and so fear becomes a prison. In fact, fear is one of the two weapons that our, our enemy Satan uses against us. I don't know if you've really thought much about that. I mean, most people in this room are followers of Jesus. They're believers in, in Jesus. And so you know that we are in a spiritual battle and, and Satan is the one who opposes you. But have you ever thought about what his weapons are? Because his weapons really are lies and fear. He uses lies to deceive us into believing untruths. And, and so to defeat lies, we have to know the truth, which begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who said he is the way, the truth, and the life. And it's also uh, about having uh, knowledge of what Scripture says, because in the Bible, it's the Word of God, therefore it is true, and it tells us what to believe and how to live, which is why we offer you to have those Bibles, because we know if you read the Bible, then God will change your life. So Satan uses lies uh, to, you know, fight against us. The other thing he uses is fear, and he uses fear to trap us. He wants to capture us with fear. 
That's why God's word tells us, do not be afraid over 300 times. Do you think God wants to get, for us to get something if he tells us 300 times? Don't be afraid. He doesn't want us to be afraid. That's why he says it over and over and over again. Because God knows our fear is going to imprison us. And fear is a prison because it steals our joy. You know, you think about it. Uh, you're not going to rejoice when you're afraid. Now, I know. Uh, let's just ask, you know, since you guys have been raising your hands anyway, how many of you love horror movies? You love, you love the scary movies? Okay. Look, some of you are kind of like this. Don't be embarrassed. If you like them, you like them, okay? It's all good. But see, that's entertainment. That, that's not real fear because that, that's, you know, the kind of fear that like when you, you know, you know, play boo with a baby and you surprise them and they laugh. Okay, it creates giggles. It's not fear at all in the real sense of the word. And, and so some of us like to be scared for entertainment, but truly being afraid makes it impossible to celebrate. You, 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 you're incapable of rejoicing when you're living in dread or panic or despair. That's what fear does to us. It steals our joy. And, and fear paralyzes us. It prevents our obedience to God. Yeah, I want you to think about this. Jesus calls us to follow him. Okay, the, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, Jesus is saying, come follow me. And, and here's the thing, fear prevents us from following Jesus because we're afraid to move. We're afraid we're going to make a mistake. We're afraid, what if I make the wrong decision? I've seen Christians who are paralyzed by fear of messing up. And, and they say, well, I'm waiting for God to show me. I'm waiting for God to show me. And they're so afraid that they're going to make the, the wrong move that they're just stuck where they are. It's like God hasn't said anything about redeeming our lives. And Jesus wants us to walk by faith and not by fear because we're afraid we're not going to go anywhere takes faith to follow Jesus. Fear will paralyze us. And fear cripples our influence for Jesus. I don't know if you thought about this, but we're supposed to be the people who represent hope to this world. We're the ones who are telling them there's a better way, there's a better place, that God wants to give us abundant life, and you can't really represent hope to people if you're uh, all doom and gloom. I don't know if you've really process this, but doom and gloom is an attitude of fear. When, when you're always talking about how terrible the world is and how awful it is and, and everything's getting so bad, and look at all the stuff that's going on. If you're pointing out all the stuff that's going wrong, it's really hard to point people to the joy of Jesus. Does that make sense? If, you, if all you see is the bad stuff and you're afraid of what's going to happen, you're afraid about terrorists and you're afraid about uh, you know, uh, the, the politics, and you're afraid about the economy, and you're afraid about the coronavirus, then it's kind of hard to turn around at the same breath and say, oh, by the way, uh, we don't have to be afraid because of Jesus. How do I put this? Chicken little doesn't, you know, inspire hope in people. <laughs> and if you don't know my reference to chicken little, then YouTube it when you get home, okay? Uh, for those of you who are under 40. Uh, so the, the whole thing, the, you're not going to inspire people to follow Jesus when you're living in fear. Fear is a prison that holds us captive and, and prevents us from following and representing Jesus to the world, living in the joy of Jesus. And here's the thing. Jesus came to set us free, to unleash us from fear. So let's talk about the progression of faith. The progression of faith. Matthew chapter 10 is a, is a powerful passage. It's, it's kind of, it can be kind of a scary passage because Jesus talks about the persecution that we're going to face. He talks about, you know, being dragged before authorities and, and stuff like that. He says, don't worry about it. But I want to pick up in verse 26 where he begins with this. Right after he's talked about how they're going to attack you and malign you and hate you and persecute you and all that kind of stuff, he says this. So, have no fear of them. Don't you love that? Have, you've got to read this, and you can do this on your own time. Read the, read the passage before this. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. 
which you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. For some of you, that's easier than others. <laughs> but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's a passage about fear and faith. See, freedom from fear begins with fearing God. Let me say that again. Freedom from fear begins with fearing God. And, and some of you are asking, does God really want us to fear him? I mean, the God who loves us, who sent Jesus to die for us? I mean, we tell people all the time, God loves us. Does God want us to be afraid of him? The answer is yes. Yes, he does, because fearing God leads to a fearless life. Let me say that again. Fearing God will lead you to a fearless life. I mean, did, did you hear the words of Jesus just a moment ago? Do not fear those who can only, I love that, who can only kill the body. <laughs> That's kind of what we fear most, isn't it? People can kill it. Jesus says, I oh, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. They can only kill the body. Rather, fear the one, fear God, who has the authority to destroy both body and soul in hell. He has the authority to condemn to hell. Now, this only makes sense if you're a follower of Jesus. And I already kind of described what it is to be a follower of Jesus, to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, Savior of the world. To do what Scripture says, to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. In this passage, Jesus says, hey, if you confess me before men, I'm going to confess you before my Father. How do we confess Jesus? How, how do we as, as a, a church confess Jesus? Well, we do it with that individual confession I just shared. with you. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Hopefully you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Otherwise, it won't do you any good. And then the, the way we publicly declare that we're followers of Jesus is what? Baptism. That's right. When you go over there in this tub or if you go to the lake with us or you go to somebody's pool and you say, hey, I want to tell the world that I'm a follower of Jesus. I want everyone to know that he's my Lord, he's my Savior, and I'm unashamed of that. And you let us dunk you. Because what we're doing. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, it is a picture of a life transformed and a life that is surrendered to Jesus. That is your public declaration before men that you're a follower of Jesus. Okay, that's why we encourage you to get baptized if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, baptism just gets you wet publicly. Okay? Doesn't do you a bit of good unless you're a follower of Jesus. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you ought to get baptized because that's your public declaration that Jesus has changed your life. So, if you're a follower of Jesus, don't fear those who can only kill the body. Now, we're talking about fear, so let's go ahead and, and you know, put everything on the table, get it out in the open. Um, why in the world would Jesus tell us not to be afraid of people who can kill the body? Well, if somebody kills you and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, where are you going to go? You're going to go to heaven. That is not really a bad thing, is it? I mean... And so if somebody kills you in this world, and you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to go to heaven where there's no more suffering. <laughs> it's not a bad gig. No more sorrow. No more death. No more pain. You go to heaven, you get a new what? Yeah, some of you are more enthusiastic saying that than others. <laughs> See, it, it, here's the deal. Yeah, I want you to really think through this because we, we've got to own it. We can't just acknowledge it. We've got to really let this sink down inside. So the worst thing an evil person can do to you, the worst thing that a virus can do to you, the worst thing that an accident can do to you, 
want you to think of this big picture, is to send you to heaven before you thought you wanted to go there. That's all it is. It's, it's send you to heaven before you believed you wanted to go there. And, and, and the reality is, once you get there, you're not going to be regretting anything from this world. Not a thing. That, that's, that's how it's going to work. All you're going to do is go, can't wait till they get here and see how good this is. See, and, and, and we want to go to heaven. We just don't think we want to go right now unless you're like really, really old and hurting and you're like, yeah, I'm ready. Sign me up. But Jesus hadn't called my name yet and I'm getting kind of irritated. So, uh, and we all know people like that. Most of us just aren't there yet. And so Jesus says, hey, deal with your fear by understanding that, that they can't take anything away from you. They really can't take anything away from you. This is why we're not terrified of a virus. This is why we're not terrified uh, of possible accidents. This is why we're not terrified uh, of evil people. Because of this life-changing truth. And I, and I want that to sink in. The Apostle Paul put it this way. In Philippians chapter 1, he said, For To me, to live is Christ and to die is it's gain. See, we know the verse, we say the verse, but do you believe the verse? Are you, are you taking hold of that in your heart? So then, if that's true, then why fear God? Why would we fear God? Proverbs chapter 1 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, it's the beginning of wisdom. So, so how does this faith progression work? Why are we to fear God? And I don't think these are in your sermon notes, so you may want to jot these down. I'm going to share with you four statements. They are movements in our Christian walk. They are movements in our following of Jesus that every one of us is being called to by God. Okay? The first one is this. Fearing God leads to obeying God. Okay? If you fear God, then you will obey God. When we understand God's power and God's authority, that God holds the keys to eternal life and eternal punishment, then we are motivated to obey him. Okay, it's kind of like my dad when I was little. My dad was a disciplinarian. Anybody else have dads like that? The most terrifying sound of my childhood was a belt being taken off at high speed. You know what I'm saying? Some of, you, some of you have PTSD from that too? Okay. That's right. You hear that sound and you're like, oh no. Your whole body just, you know, cringes. You don't run because that's even worse. But, but here's the thing. My dad was a disciplinarian, but he loved me. And I knew that he loved me. And as a child, I loved him and I feared him. As an adult, I loved him and respected him. But the fear of punishment inspired obedience. So, we start off by fearing God leads to obeying God, and then the second movement is obeying God leads to knowing God. If you obey God, you're going to get to know God. You see, when we obey, we live a wisdom-filled life. We begin to see and experience God's blessings, because as you obey God, good stuff happens in your life. And you start to grasp the principle that you reap what you sow. And when you learn that principle that you reap what you sow, and you really learn it, you start sowing to the Spirit because from the Spirit you reap life. And you start avoiding sowing to the flesh because from the flesh you reap death. And you want life instead of death. And so that, that obeying leads to knowing. And we begin to understand that God's laws are an extension of His love. That God really just desires to bless us and to protect us from ourselves. And so... Fearing God leads to obeying God. Obeying God leads to knowing God. And then knowing God leads to trusting God. Knowing God leads to trusting God. Now, I'm absolutely, now, after I've started obeying God and I started experiencing that, now I'm absolutely certain God is for me. I know without any doubt that His promises are true. I know God's going to bless, God's going to protect. So I trust God even more. Okay, I start trusting God with my obedience, right? 
because uh, I start doing what the, uh, the hard things that he challenges me to do. So I forgive my enemies. I, I give God my money because I trust him with it. I, I, I follow him with my family. I love my family the way that he told me to love them. I, I, I start trusting God with my decisions. I allow God to direct my life. I start living Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God and he will direct your paths. We love to quote that verse, but to live it, you have to actually trust God and say, God, you're going to guide me and I'm not going to maybe do what you say. I'm going to do what you say no matter where you lead me to. And, and we start trusting God with outcomes. With outcomes. We start trusting God with outcomes. And, and here's the thing. That means that we believe that God's going to redeem. Do you know what drives us crazy? Do you know what drives us to worry? How's this going to turn out? What's going to happen with this? And we try to control the outcome rather than just our actions. Can I, can I just tell you something? You are not in control of outcomes. You are only in control of your choices. You choose what you're going to do. You choose the character that you're going to live. And all of the outcomes are out of your control. But so many times we worry about what our kids are going to choose, or we worry about what they're going to do at work, or we worry about all these things, and we're afraid of the outcomes. You know what happens is you really develop trust in God? You stop worrying about the outcomes. You know why? Because you know that God's going to redeem. He's going to, all you're worried about is, is my life lining up with the character of Jesus? Because if my life lines up with the character of Jesus, then I know God's for me, and he's going to be working in my life to redeem my life. See, fear wants guarantees of what the outcome is going to look like. Faith just trusts God's, uh, God with the, the outcomes. It's going to be all right because God redeems. And here's what happens. So knowing God leads to trusting God, and as I grow in my trust, trusting God leads to a fearless life. Okay, trusting God leads to a fearless life. It, it leads to a life uh, that is boldly loving and, and full of joy. It leads to a life of creative freedom. It leads to a life of purpose and influence for Jesus. It, it leads to a life that is fueled by the reality that heaven is next, so nothing in this world terrifies us. Let me say that again. It leads to a life that is fueled by the reality that heaven is next, so nothing in this world terrifies me. Right? Do not fear those that can only kill the body. The only fear you really need to have is for the one who can cast both body and soul into hell, but because you're obeying God, you know God, you're trusting God, you're not afraid of God anymore because you know he's for you and not against you. Not just, you know, as a pithy saying, but as a reality in your heart. So do you fear God enough to obey him? Are you obeying God enough to discover his goodness? Do you know God well enough to trust him? And is your trust in God defeating your fear? That's the progression of faith. Now, let's talk for a minute about the path to freedom. Okay, just as there's a progression of faith, this is how God's growing us and teaching us. Let's talk about the path to freedom. How are we going to get there? If we want to overcome fear, if we want to confront our fear, if we want to face our fear, if we want to do this, then how do we find our way to freedom? Because fear is real. And every one of us have fear in our life. It shows up often. So how do we follow Jesus through our fears? How can we find freedom? And I'm going to share with you three steps. These are not like steps you take one time. These are repetitive steps that you do over and over and over again. And the more you do them, the more you're going to find your way getting toward freedom. Now, as I share these steps, let me just uh, have this disclaimer. If you are on medication that helps you with anxiety or depression, these are not a substitute for that. These are an accompaniment for that. Okay, listen to your doctors. There are physical reasons that, uh, that some of you are on that medication. And maybe these steps will help you need that medication less. But don't just quit because, oh, the pastor said, here's the path to freedom and I don't need the, the meds anymore. So um, I'm not telling you that. Apply both the medical and the spiritual and see what God does. Okay? There's nothing wrong with, with uh, needing meds. Uh, I take, you know, high blood, uh, blood pressure medicine every day because my blood pressure is high and I can't get it down by losing weight because I like ice cream. And uh, 
See, you reap what you sow. And, uh, but it's hereditary, and uh, it's because I'm, I'm a sinner and because of my body is broken by sin. So, uh, so there's nothing wrong. I take, I take high blood pressure meds. If you take anxiety meds or depression, but that's, that's okay. That's, that your body's broken, and we get, medicine can help. So let's talk about the path to, th- to freedom. Three repetitive steps. The first one is acknowledge your fear. Acknowledge your fear. Admit it. Truth is necessary for victory over fear. Honesty with yourself is essential. I, I, I loved that uh, in, in Valerie's testimony how she said she, you know, she went to rehab and there she had to get honest about everything, about everything. So what, have you, what are you afraid of besides spiders and snakes? Okay? What, are, what are you really afraid of? Are you, are you afraid of the unknown? The future, what's going to happen down the road? I already told you, we don't know that stuff. We don't control those outcomes. God does. We already know our future if you're a follower of Jesus. That's not in doubt. What's going to happen between now and then, we're not sure of, but we know where we're going. Uh, By the way, you know what the unknown is for children? It's the dark. It's the dark. How many of you, like me, were afraid of the dark as kids? Yeah. I'm not going to ask you to confess now if you're still afraid of the dark or not, but uh, I slept with a light on in my room until I was like nine. Okay, not like a little cute nightlight thing. I'm talking about the lamp. <laughs> it was on. It's what imaginations and dark, darkness will do for you. Uh, are you afraid of discovery? Uh, you know, and, and call it whatever you want. Humiliation, embarrassment, rejection. You know, that, that process of being judged or rejected because people discover the real you. Are you living in fear that they're going to find out the real you and they're not going to like you anymore because of who you are, what you've done, where you've been, you know, all that kind of stuff? See, confession is the antidote to that fear. It sets us free. And I want you to know that Calvary is a confession place. We're not afraid of your past. We've not, we're not afraid of what you've done, where you've been, the mistakes you've made, the struggles you've faced. We believe that God's grace really is enough. We, we believe that God redeems uh, from, from wherever you've been. And if this is your first time in here and you walked in and you're carrying a load of, uh, of stuff and, and you're afraid that we're going to find out, don't be. This is a, na- a no-shame zone. Okay, if someone around you tries to shame you, send them to me, okay? Uh, this is a no-shame zone. Because we understand that all of us are fallen and all of us need God and God redeems all of our lives. And so uh, we're not afraid of your mistakes. Or are you afraid of just looking foolish? I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, embarrassment. Uh, okay, look, we try to put you at ease for looking foolish every week. Okay? We make mistakes. We do dumb stuff. Uh, we're far from perfect. We get that. So really, what are you afraid of? You know, you know what my fear is that, that I have to fight on a pretty constant basis? It's the fear of failure. It's, a, it's just that I don't want to fail. And so it's always whispering in my ear to, oh, play it safe, or don't mess up, or work harder, or, you know, uh, maybe just try to control the outcomes. Wants to steal my joy and, and ruin my witness, all that kind of stuff. So what are you afraid of? You've got to acknowledge your fear. That's the first step that, that's those repetitive path to freedom. The, the second one is you've got to confront your fear. So you acknowledge it. That's great. Honesty is wonderful. Then you've got to confront your fear. That's step number two. You got to refuse to let fear own you, define you, or limit you. We should be on confront your fear now. Uh, You might need help at this point because fears can be really complicated. Uh, They they can be driven from, you know, past trauma or pain in your life, uh, brokenness in your life. uh, And and so we, we probably need friends. We need support groups. We need advocates helping us overcome. That's why counseling is so important. That's why Celebrate Recovery is so important. You need that, that support that says you can do this. And by the way, confronting your fear won't make it stop. Let me say that again. Confronting your fear will not make it stop. But confronting your fear is deciding to let courage rule the day rather than your fear. Okay? It's deciding to let courage rule the day. I've seen people who are terrified of flying, I mean absolutely terrified of flying, get on an airplane and fly to see their children and then their grandchildren. 
I mean, you know, and that's, and they still are terrified of flying. They still don't want to fly, but they'll still do it. I've seen people who are medically terrified. We're talking about, you know, a phobia of needles. Anybody got that one? Okay, yeah. And, 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 uh, and yet, because they felt called to go on a mission trip, uh, went and got the shot so they could go on the mission trip through the tears, the hysteria, the crying, the sobbing, whatever you want to call it, uh, because they believed in that calling more than they wanted to surrender to that fear. That's confronting that fear. I've seen people who, who didn't want everyone to know their story make a video telling their story because they wanted to help other people who are broken like they've been broken, and they wanted other people to find the redemption in Christ that they have found. Uh, and, and that's true of Valerie, that's true of others that didn't want to. They confronted that fear and demonstrated what it is uh, because every person who sits there and making those testimonies says, uh, this is hard. It's really hard. You see, the path to freedom requires acknowledging your fear and then confronting your fear. And then you got to decide to trust God. You got to decide to trust God. This is active faith. So many times in church, irritates me. So many times in church, people say, well, we just got to trust God. And what they mean by we just got to trust God is we don't have to do anything. That is not how God works. He calls us to, what does Jesus want us to do? Follow him, right? Follow means active. You got to be going. You got to be doing. So we got to decide to trust God. And so in your fears, you, gotta, you, you might even want to pray something like this. God, I'm afraid, but I've chosen to trust you. So help me to walk by faith and to overcome my fear. Because that might be your prayer. If fear is a huge issue in your life, that might be your prayer. So what do we need to trust God with? We need to trust God with his presence. You know that God's with you, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Isaiah chapter 41 says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's with you. The psalmist said this, Psalm 23, David. You guys know this one. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You're with me. Valley of the shadow of death. Some of you have been there. Some point in your life. God was with you. So we can trust God with his presence. He's always going to be with you. You don't have to be afraid. You can trust God with his provision. God's going to redeem your life. We've talked about this a little bit. Listen to Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul says, We know that those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. To those who love God, to those called according to his purpose. How many things? All things. All things. You don't see it in that moment. You can't see it in the midst of the tragedy and the fear and the brokenness, but God's promise is still there. His provision is still there. He's going to redeem. Again, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43 this time. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, and you are mine. You ought to write that one down because you don't know that one. Isaiah 43, 1. And then go read that, especially that last part. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. That's God's word to you. To you. You're his child. You're in his family. He knows you by name. He's called you by name. He's going to redeem your life. So trust God with his provision. And then finally, trust God with his promise. His promise. We've talked about this. The promise of eternal life. Right? The psalmist says in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I think the answer is no one. No one. How about Jesus' words in John 14? Usually share these at a funeral. Let not your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. This is Jesus talking. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me that where I am, you will always be. So there. 
Okay? It, but trusting means you actually live your life based on God's promise that He's going to take you to heaven one day, and so you don't have to fear those who can only kill the body. We only have to fear God, and because we fear God, we find out that we don't have to. We can live fearlessly. So fear is a prison. Jesus came to set you free. Which path are you going to choose to walk? Which way are you going to live your life? Let's pray. God, you know our fears. You know there's some that uh, are plagued by fears, fears for their health, fears for their finances, fears for their children or their grandchildren, fears for their spouse, fears about travel, fears about the country, the world, sicknesses. God, there's so many fears that are out there. Can we just hear your voice tonight? Can we just hear you telling us to have faith, to not be afraid? Can the, can the words fear not just echo in our souls resounding in our hearts, giving us courage to live for Jesus like never before. God, can we walk out of here and be those people who represent a faith in Jesus so strong that nothing in this world causes us to panic or lose hope? God, that's who we want to be. So right now, we just invite your Holy Spirit to move, to speak, to lead, to control us. In Jesus' name.